Bless you. Cool. Okay, so up to last week is what is your expected to know for your test. This week's lecture is not in this test, it will be in the next box test. Um, and we're going to get started on something we're only going to finish at the beginning of the next block as well, which is matrix decomposition. But I think um, this chapter is probably my favorite because I think it ties together a lot of the ideas we've been covering in the first four lectures. Uh, and it's particularly, uh, at least, I think it closes the loop on a, on a couple of things and kind of explains why we cared about some of the definitions and concepts uh, we introduced at the beginning, which is kind of nice because I think that's a little bit satisfying. After that, we then go into uh, calculus and optimization, which is more of like a, a little standalone thing. Um, there's ways that it ties in, and I do touch on those things, but in general, um, it's this is kind of like a, I think, conception, like a nice stopping point, so a nice midway point through the course at least. Uh, so, at its core, matrix decomposition is the re expression of some original matrix into a number of subcomponents or parts. This is typically in the form of a matrix product or weighted sum of matrices. The ones we really look at here is the, uh, a couple of matrix products. Uh, the reaction is typically exposed, uh, exposes fundamental aspects of the original matrix in a more direct manner. So in particular, things like eigen decomposition and singular value decomposition have a very interpretable representation of what's going on. And that interpretation is particularly useful because what it does is it sometimes, for example, turn a complicated one n by n dimensional problem into, let's say, n one dimensional problems and things like that. And then as we know, one dimensional problems are significantly easier to solve. And so that's kind of at least one of the reasons why we would want to look at these things. The other, the other angle is just maybe interpretability of our data and things like that. And so a simple example of this concept is in the context of natural numbers. So for any x in the natural numbers, we can rewrite x as a product of primes. So, for example, 24 can be written as 2 to the power of 3 times by 3. That is now re-expressed 24 as something that is slightly more fundamental and shared between all numbers, the fact that they can all be re rewritten uh, as a product of prime numbers. And let's just check my note quickly. So it says another good example of this is taking the exponential of a matrix. So, yeah, another place where something like the eigen decomposition comes in is if you want to do, you know, A times A times A times A, the way you do this, is to first do the eigen decomposition. So you're not doing n matrix multiplications. What you're doing is one eigen decomposition getting into a bunch of 1D systems. And in that case, you just do the do the, the normal power of like a one dimensional power that you would know. And you do that in a single uh, eigen values or singular values. We'll come to that. But there's a couple examples there of kind of where these things are useful. And so, as always, here is the, the map of the concepts of this chapter. So what we're going to mainly focus on today is the determinants and ideas around invertibility, a little bit on the, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And then from next week and the week after that, the beginning of the week after that, we'll go into uh, eigen decomposition a bit more, diagonalization, singular value decomposition, and Kolesky decomposition. So there's a couple of these. Um, in general, Kolesky decomposition isn't I don't find it to be as interpretable, but it is particularly useful if you want to compute something. It's just more of a computational tool than a, an interpretability tool, but it is relatively easy to understand, which makes it uh, um, also kind of sometimes a bit more useful. Uh, so Kolesky decomposition is also sometimes called LL decomposition, and it's used a lot in Gaussian processes. Uh, Gaussian processes are infinite dimensional Gaussian distributions. Um, Eigenvalues give us what is called the spectrum of a matrix. So I put that in there, just uh, that's a little bit of terminology to map out here. So your spectrum of a matrix is the set of all eigenvalues. And then your eigenvectors are also used, or eigenvectors are also used with PDEs and ODEs and second order optimization. Again, kind of to try and linearize or kind of disentangle the system that you're working with. So the first kind of new concept we're going to be looking at is the determinants. And though these are only defined for square matrices, and we'll kind of touch on why in a minute, but we denote the determinant of A as follows. So on the left, it's just, you know, depth of A, but it can also be denoted with these two kind of uh, just vertical bars, no squaring on them or nothing round or anything. So just, you know, keep track. If you do see this notation, it is kind of subtle, um, but this is a determinant. And then if you have like a square, uh, obviously like something like that. 
something like that, then it's just a normal matrix. Quite obvious, but anyway, just keep an eye out for that. And so the determinant is taking in a matrix that is n by n. So again, that must be square and mapping it onto a singular value. And before we define how to calculate the term determinants, the application it is calculate the determinant and the application is worth briefly exploring kind of what it intuitively means. Um, and so if you recall in chapter two, uh, in the two by two matrix case, you can get an explicit formula for the inverse. So I don't really touch on it there, but I'm going to go through it now. So if you wanted to invert a matrix in the two by two case, there is a closed form solution for it. And you kind of, you can just derive this based on doing your um, Gaussian elimination that you've been doing for a while now. Um, but what it essentially comes out to is some shuffling of the elements of A, all right? So you swap the diagonals across, and then you swap the off diagonals and add a negative, okay? So you rewrite your matrix like that, and then you divide by this scalar at the bottom here. That scalar at the bottom is the determinant of this matrix. It corresponds to taking A, there's A11, A12, A21, A22. It corresponds to taking this matrix, taking the product along the diagonal, and then subtracting the product of the off diagonal. So similar kind of to what we're doing there with the reshuffling, but now you're doing the product instead of just swapping the indices. And if you do this, you get that scalar value, and that is known as the determinant. And so you can see here that in this case where this is zero, where you have a zero determinant, you're going to end up having one divided by zero. And we know from school that you cannot divide by zero. That is an invalid operation. So what is Going on here, well, firstly, the determinant is telling us whether or not a matrix is inversible, at least in two dimensions, right? It is a more general concept. So if your matrix, if your determinant of a matrix is zero in any dimensions, then that, that matrix is not invertible, but it comes out quite clearly in this inverse formula for a matrix. Okay. And what is really going on here is the determ determinant is telling us how much volume changes when we apply A. So the whole time throughout this course, we've been looking at this sort of computation. So A of X is equal to Y. All right. And we've been talking about how you're projecting onto the columns of A. And A is telling you, like, if you stretch in one direction or compress up along another and things like that, the determ determinant is telling you how much volume is changed by applying that matrix as a, as a whole to the space. All right. And so this idea of a change in volume is usually going to be represented as some kind of one by one by however many ends one um, square or cube or something like that. Okay, so it's just like a cube. And if you went three dimensions, it's going to be a one by one by one cube. And then after that, you apply A to your matrix. You apply A to this matrix and you map it into a different space. And let's say you stretch that dimension and compress this one. That worked out terribly. But you get the point. So you've now compressed one dimension, stretched the other. It will tell you if this was a one by one by one cube, its volume was one over there. It will now tell you how much this volume has changed to give you that new kind of rectangular cube in 3D in this case. Okay. And so that's what the determinant is doing. So then why does it matter when the determinant is zero? Well, that is telling me is you've taken something with a one volume and smashed it down to having no volume. So when we were speaking about losing rank, and we're saying that uh, if you're applying a matrix A to X and you lose rank, it has a null space that is not just zero. Um, that means that you are leaving some dimension behind. You're taking a cube and you're mapping it down to a square, something along those lines. In that case, you have now taken something that had volume being the cube and you've lost the dimension so it no longer has volume in that number of dimensions. It's now just zero volume. Okay. And that's the whole point of the, the determinant. It summarizes those that kind of information, how much you've stretched the space by applying the mapping. Is everyone happy then with the with the intu intuition behind this determinant? So it is going to be important when you think about you know why these things work and things like that. Thank you to the person online who responded. Cool. All right. So testing for invertibility. So for any square matrix, it holds that. Uh, a is invertible if and only if your determinant is non-zero. So you can directly see this in n equals one to three cases. Uh, for obviously 1D, if A is zero, then you obviously can't divide by A. Okay, and I've drawn that on the right-hand side there. But that's just a scalar value that's you know obvious from normal algebra. In 2D, I just showed you the 
formula for this. So we know that if A11 times by A22 is the product of the diagonals minus the product of your off diagonals is zero, then you can't do that division uh, or inverse equation I just showed you on the previous slide. And then for n equals three, you can use what is called Saris's rule. And this is just an equation that you, you know, kind of, I guess, memorize. It has just a pattern to it of how do you compute this determinant. I have drawn kind of up, I've drawn over here how you would compute this normally. That is a different way of getting the determinant, which we'll chat about in like two minutes. But uh, in general, there's two ways. There's this normal way that you would have probably been, in, you would have probably been taught before. And then Saris's rule where you just memorize as the pattern of like taking your diagonals and then kind of adding and subtracting everything else. I don't really use Saris's rule. I don't, you know, like it. I think it's um, unnecessary. Just rather do it by first principles. You can derive Saris's rule just by doing it this way. Okay. So if you ever need to use Saris's rule for some reason, do this and just kind of go through the normal determinant thinking. And importantly, determinants have a lot of very special cases where, so as you can see, even going to three dimensions here, it becomes really complicated. This is a much worse equation to be dealing with than this one over here. So just by adding a dimension to your problem, you've now made this determinant much more difficult to calculate. But there are special cases where things get really easy, such as if your matrix is in a triangle form. So if it's upper or lower triangular matrix, okay? So if T is an N by N matrix, then T is upper triangular. If for all I, J, or if for all I greater than J, the T, I, J index is equal to zero. So for example, if this bit over here, everything below the diagonal is zero, all right? And then it is a lower triangular matrix if everything above the diagonal is zero. So that's kind of what this is saying. If I is then less than J, then you know it's gotta be zero. Okay, so if I is greater than J, you, you know you're speaking about below the diagonal. And if I is less than J, you know you're speaking about above the diagonal. All right. And then obviously then if this kind of note here is saying that if you have, if you fully diagonalize your matrix, so if you get it into reduced row echelon form, what you have is a lower and an upper triangular matrix. So it can be both if it's just diagonal. Uh, but in general, when we get it into just normal row echelon form, you're going to put it into an upper triangular matrix. Okay, so if you ever have a really kind of full determinant and a really big one to calculate, sometimes it is a better idea to get it into row echelon form first. And then you just take the product of the diagonal because that, in this case, that is then how you get the determinant, right? Because if you look at the Saros's rule or anything else, like all these other formulas, which I'll show you now, the pattern is that if you have anything below the diagonal is zero, anything above the diagonal is zero, then everything is going to be multiplied by a zero, except that first term, over here, I'll this by the way, except for this first term over here, which is just the product of your diagonals. You can see every other term, even in Soros's rule, has some kind of off diagonal element to it that is either above or below the diagonal in all of those terms. And so in that case, the only thing that's left is the diagonal there. And so that's one case where diagonalizing a matrix, getting it into row echelon form might be a more useful thing to do to start a problem particularly because computing the determinants of anything higher than 3D or even, you know, Saros's rule is gives us 3D, but anything higher than that, you have to do the full pattern of it. And it gets complicated and it's really, really slow to populate. And it's a, a recursive algorithm. So computers even hate doing it. And so row echelon form is also slow, but it's less slow than that. All right. So what if T is not triangular, right? So if it is triangular, you just take the product of the diagonals. But if it's not, then we need a more generalized algorithm. And the most common approach to this is to use the plus expansion, which is a recursive approach. It's what I just showed our two sides back for 3D. And as I said, it generalizes Saros's rule. Um, but this is the, the general equation for it. And so from taking the determinant of A, what you're going to do is number one, you're going to have this pattern of negative ones uh, raised to a power. So this will kind of give you some kind of checkerboard. So if we're in 3D, it will be uh, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. Okay, so that's what this component here is going to do for us. It's going to tell us the sign in front of our next term. Then you're going to take the K and J uh, elements of this matrix, and you're going to multiply it by the determinant which remains after that, all right? 
So if again, if I have a three by three matrix here and we're expanding along column J, then what you're going to end up doing is taking, let's actually do proper notation here. That's A11, A12, A13. So we're expanding along column one. So that means we're going to be running down this way along this column. And so while we're doing this, we're going to be taking this term. So it's going to be A11 times by the submatrix which remains. And that's this notation here. This is saying take column, take the matrix A and delete column J, uh, KJ from it. Give me the submatrix that survives that computation. And so that is that. I've deleted K, which is one, and J, which is one over there. And I'm just left with that submatrix. And so you're going to then go A22, A23, and so on. Okay? If, on the other hand, I was then, so we're expanding down the columns. Let me just try to clean this up a little bit. That may be too much of a hassle. Okay, so the next term after that is going to be, you get, so you're going to take that term, then you're going to add in this term here, so you're running down the column, but as you can see, that is in now item k equal to 2, j equal to 1, so it's the power of 3, so that's going to be a negative 1 over there. Okay, so you have negative a, 2, 1, times by the matrix that remains when you delete its row and column, so it's a, 1, 2, a, 1, 3, so on. And these should be, sorry, these should be vertical lines, not matrix lines, but anyway. All right, so that's the kind of computation you're going to be doing. You're going to be running through that pattern whenever you want to, um, when you want to calculate these things. But it's a recursive algorithm because the first step towards this pattern is to give you another determinant, right? So we went from a three by three determinant down to three two by two determinants, but it's still a thing that is now trash to compute, right? Like if this was a four by four matrix, you're then going to get four three by three determinants, and those three by three determinants are going to give you three two by two determinants. So you're going to end up with what 12 terms in your calculation. And it just sucks. Calculating determinants is long and boring and bad for computers. Similarly, and uh, you can do this along rows. The exact same pattern will hold. You're just going to instead of taking your terms down one of the columns, you're going to take it along one of the rows, and that is fine. And the reason that you can do this. And just, just to mention, I don't love the notation that they use here because they are transposing. Um, what they've done here is they, you can see they've swapped KJ and JK. So what they've actually done is transpose your matrix and then use the exact same equation over. So what they're doing here is they're still, you know, expanding along the column. They're just expanding along the column of A transpose, which is then the same as expanding along the row. But just if you are trying to read the notation literally, that's actually what they've done. OK, uh, so just be careful about that. But that is because the determinant of a matrix A is going to be equal to the determinant of A transpose. All right, so I want you guys to keep this in mind for a couple of slides because we're going to come back to this in, in a couple of them. But just note that, and then that's why you can expand along either the row or the column, and it doesn't make a difference because you can then always just transpose it and then do the column or row version. Everyone comfortable with how you compute a determinant? All right, because you are going to have to do it. So you need to. Hello. 
Yes. Yes. Yeah, and that's because it's the same as A transposed. Right, so if, if you have this matrix here and it's all of that, but A11, A12, A13, and I transpose it, then I'm going to end up with the matrix that's A11, A12, A13. All right, and so in that case, then you expand down the columns and determine to give the same value. Uh, you don't also have to use the first row or the first column. You can actually expand along whatever row, whatever column you like. You will always get the same answer as long as you apply that checkerboard. This again, this thing properly, right? That's that's the key to keeping everything consistent here. So we can look at an example here that is three by three. So if we use approach two and select the first row, you arrive at this term here. Okay, so we're expanding along the first row. So this is term one and one one. So you take Minus one, raise it to the power of one plus one, so two, so that gives you a positive value. You take its term, you put it in there, and then you multiply by the determinant of the matrix that remains, so one, two, zero, one. All right, then you expand on the next element of the row, so element one, two, negative one raised to the power of three, that gives you a negative, times by its value, so two over there, and then you take the row and the column that remain after you delete these two here, and you get. 3, 2, 0, 1 over there. And so on, you follow this pattern, you'll come out to the solution here. But the issue is that um, this is a massive waste of time because we also had this row down here that we could expand along. But you can see that it has a whole bunch of zeros. All right? And so if you just expand along that row, the first three terms are going to fall away, right? Because you're essentially going to have zero there. The, sorry, the first two terms are going to fall away. You can have zero there, zero there. That's nothing, that's nothing. And then you're just left with what would be your third term. All right? So to kind of elaborate more on what I said now, I won't give you a full five by five, but there might definitely be cases in the exam where you need to look upon the matrix and realize that you have a row of zeros. And in that case, it then becomes a lot easier. Okay? So that's more what I'm looking to test in exams and that sort of thing is, you know, do you have the insight to know what's going on to make life easy for yourselves rather than can you just, you know, hit a problem with an equation, with a formula or a method? Um, I trust you guys can all do that. I also know that you all have computers to do that for you. So that's, that's not kind of the interest here. So make sure you're making life easy for yourselves if you see a row of zeros in a determinant or a column of zeros. Anywhere in the matrix. It could have also been something like that being zero like that. Whatever. Okay. But the important bit here is that as you can see, you come out to minus five in both cases. Does anyone want to try and interpret what it means that we got a negative for the determinant? Yeah. What were you going to say? Um, I think you can size your points or so then you can size the points. Okay, so that would be if you get a value that is between 0 and 1. Okay, then you're taking your volume and you're halving it, let's say, if it's 0 0.5. So you're correct. It is What you're doing is you're flipping the side of the axis. So if I had a 2D box over there, like that, and I get a negative determinant, what I'm actually, let's say I get negative one, all right? So I'm preserving the volume, but I'm, what I'm doing is I'm flipping sides. You're gonna end up with an equal volume or equal area square on that side there. So that's what it means when you get a negative, is you're flipping along the other side of the axis. And then, to your point, if you get a value between, you know, like 0 0.5, what you're then doing is you're having a smaller square like that. All right. Again, th these are the things that are going to help you a lot going forward for the next two or three lectures. So please make sure you're getting the intuition of determinants. If you're not, like if you don't know that answer to that, please slow me down and tell me why, so I can you know, help explain more.
Everyone online happy? Guys online, are you with us? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, no questions? Okay, so some useful properties of the term determinants. If you have two matrices A and B and they're both N by N, then the determinant of their product, so A times B, is equal to the determinant of each of them individually and then taking the product of that. Obviously, one of these is a slower thing to do, but matrix multiplication isn't very efficient to begin with. On top of that, the other principle that we've gone through is the determinant of A is equal to the transpose of A. The determinant of this transpose. All right, and then if A is regular, so we know that that's another term for non singular or invertible. So if A can be inverted, then the determinant of the inverse of A is equal to one over the determinant of A. And another question to put you guys on the spot how would you go about proving this third property? Based on what are you know those three points? Guys online, feel free to you know have a shot as well because this is important. Yeah. Um, you take the say a matrix a multiplied by identity matrix. And then take it the determine using the first um, property that you get. So uh, walk, sorry, walk me through this. I think you're on the right track. So do you want you want the determinant of this? I'm just gonna use B, uh, capital D. So you want the determinant of that? Yes. Okay. And then um, it's gonna equal to the determinant of matrix A. Okay. As well as since. You know, the determinant of an identity, I think it's one. You're correct, yes. Oh, no. <laughs> no, but you're, you're extremely close. You're, you're, there is a little bit of an issue on your first step here, but you are very close. Anyone else want to try and build on that quickly? What do we know about what's the definition of an inverse of a matrix? Someone told me that at least, and we can, I think we'll then get it. There we go. Uh, I screwed it up on that. Okay, so if you, we know that A times A inverse equals the identity matrix, right? So you guys want to carry on volume on what we showed before, so what do we do next? Yeah? There you go. So the, there you go, you got it. So determinant of, uh, it's just a small version. Determinant of A, A transpose is equal to one, because we know again, determinant of I is equal to one, as we pointed out correctly. Then you split it up like this, so D of A, D of A inverse is equal to one, and then you just take that over the other side. All right, so you see how when you wanna prove these things, a lot of times the, the maths and everything else follows really easily. And it's just about that first step of actually defining what you know kind of properly. So, I mean, you were like on the right track with saying that A times the inverse, it was just a little bit of the, the ordering of these things. But uh, that is usually the hard part of a proof is knowing what that first key definition is and then everything else after that journey just follows from computation. All right, then there are other important properties of a determinant. So if A and B are similar matrices, then the determinant of A is equal to the determinant of B. So this means the determinant is invariant to the choice of basis of a linear mapping. All right, so we went through similar matrices last week, and we said that a matrix is similar to A, if there exists some invertible matrix S, such that you can then take 
S on the right hand side, then multiply by the similar matrix itself, and then S inverse on the left, and that'll be the same as doing A. All right, and that's kind of that whole tri uh, square process we went through where we were saying like, can I first change bases, then do a mapping that I know, change bases back, and then use that to try and interpret an original kind of, or some or like solve for some other mapping that is equivalent, but in a different change of basis. And that is what we said was a, a similar matrix. And so that's exactly the case here. But what is important to note then is that if we're trying to think intuitive, intuitively about what determinants are doing, what this means is that how we represent the space, our basis doesn't matter, right? Because we know that when I divide by, go from kilometers to meters, I've shortened my basis vector, but then I've uh, you know, multiplied by the corresponding amount for that actual coordinate, so the line hasn't changed. What that means is I've re-represented my space, but the space itself hasn't changed. The line on the ground is the same. And what the determinant is telling us is how much we actually stretch the space itself, okay? So again, a change of basis will not change how much you stretch or uh, contract the space. Try to bring this up. All right. And then adding a multiple of a column of or row to any one, any other one does not change the determinant. That comes from kind of your Gaussian elimination ideas. Uh, we know that when you're doing Gaussian elimination, what that is very similar to doing is applying some kind of change of basis. So again, your basis isn't going to affect what the computation is actually doing. Similarly, if you take a scalar value, so lambda is elements of the reals here, and you multiply by A and then do the determinant, it's the same as doing the determinant of A and then multiplying by lambda raised to the power n, where n is your number of dimensions. And what this is doing is that when I multiply by lambda, if I've got my three by three bo box that I, you know, have one volume, and I'm trying to understand how much I'm stretching the box. If I am multiplying by lambda along every dimension, the volume of that box is not going to increase by lambda, it's lambda cubed, right? Because it was times by 10 along x, y, and z. So it's times by 10 by 10 by 10. And that's why you have the power raised here. And the rules say the same for whatever dimension 1D box you're trying to, you're trying to work with. Okay? And so that's because the reason for that power is because the determinant is talking about space, volume in general, not just like an, uh, along one axis. Um, I've kind of given the answer here, but you can prove the similar matrices thing using uh, the first two principles we have above. So for example, if I have A and I know that I can have a similar matrix B, again, when you're trying to do these proofs, the whole point is how you start. What do you, what's your key in, in, insights to begin the proof? And the key insight here is that if A is similar to B, then we know we can write it as that, okay? Similar to when we were just doing this inverse proof. All right, and then after that, all we do is then, you know, apply the determinant, as we said, pretty straightforward to that on both sides, and then we know that we can then split all of the determinants up. All right, from this first property up top there, we know that we can split the multiplications along the, the, the determinants. That's what we do to all three of them over there. And then after that, we know that if determinants of S is doing some stretch by K, then its inverse is gonna do one over K, right? Because that's that third property, which we actually derive over here. Right, so now we use that property there. And so what we're left with is one over K times by K is one, and you're just left with the determinant of B. All right, so everything else follows from just the rules we've established. But again, you need to know that the first step of this is A is equal to the formula for a similar matrix. Okay, and then swapping two rows or columns changes the sign of the determinants. And in general, I find this one to be the most kind of unintuitive. It's more, I don't, I should look into it. I don't quite know what a geometric interpretation of this property is, to be honest. But you can see it really easily in this equation here for the two by two uh, over here. If I'm swapping, let's say, these two rows, okay, what we're going to end up getting is A21, A22, A11, A12. And so when I do this product along the diagonal minus the off diagonal, what I'm now going to get is A12, A21 minus A11, A22. 
two, two. And you can see now that there's a negative sign in front of that term, but it was originally the term over there with the positive in front of it. So you can see that this just kind of like the negatives of whether or not it's on the diagonal or off the diagonal have now shuffled when we swap the rows and columns. And so that's kind of all that's, you know, on, on a much higher dimensional scale, the exact same pattern is following there. All right. So those are all the key properties of a determinant. In particular, you can see that I think the first one's really important. I think the similarity one's important. And I think the one about the inverse is particularly key. Then to another operator, which I think the geometric interpretation, again, it, it, maybe this is something I should also look into more, is what the trace is doing. So the trace is super easy to compute. What you're going to do is you can take your matrix and add the diagonal elements of it. All right, you can see it's a summation here now over there. All right, and so it satisfies a couple of properties. Firstly, if you have A plus B, then taking the trace of that is the same as first doing trace of A plus the trace of B. And that's just coming from the fact that uh, scalar addition is commutative and associative and all these things. So that's kind of just fairly straightforward. Similarly, if you're going to be multiplying all of the elements of A by alpha, then you've multiplied all elements along the diagonal by alpha. So you can then just factor it out and it's the same as just multiplying by the trace of, alpha, uh, trace of A. All right. And then if you have an n-dimensional identity matrix, the trace will just tell you the number of dimensions. It's n. Okay, and then lastly, if you take the product of A and B, and then you take the trace of that, or, or you take the trace of B A, then that's that will be equal. Again, just remember that in general you cannot just commute matrix multiplication. So in general, that's not going to exist. But here we've set up the matrices such that it would exist from both ways. So A is n by k, and B is k by n. So in the case where it's A times B. You're going to get a matrix that is n by n at the end, and in this case, you're going to get a k by k matrix. But if you just kind of run through the computation of it, of doing the matrix multiplication, the way that the summation works, what lies on the diagonal of these two matrices, when summed together, will be added together. So you're saying, what's the geometric interpretation of the trace? I said it doesn't really, to my knowledge, have a very particularly clean idea of it. What the diagonal is kind of telling us is just how much each dimension individually is going to push, uh, this kind of operation is going to push individually on each dimension. So without any sort of coupling between them, that's kind of what the diagonal of a matrix A is telling us. But, you know, what it means to then sum those contracts or, you know, expansions or contractions along the axes themselves, I'm not in super certain if there is actually a really nice clean geometric interpretation. Does that at least answer the question? Okay. Yeah, I'll try to find I'll try to find one. I know I've looked into it before and come out to the conclusion that it's not a, a particularly intuitive geometric thing. But maybe I should I'll try again for, for next block. I know it's, it comes up again in the next lecture anyway. So the fourth property actually generalizes to invariance under, under cycle permutations. So for example, you can actually just keep cycling all of these matrices. So if you have AKL, then you can take L out front and then you get LAK. And then after that, you can take K out front and then you get KLA. So you can just cycle these things as much as you want. And you'll still always get the same trace. And in general, it is just a property of how matrix multiplication is done by taking row times column then we cycle this called words on column and things like that. But it also then relies very heavily, and I think this is where a lot of the intuition gets lost. It relies very heavily on the fact that like A has a particular shape that matches with K, that matches with L. And that's also why it's only the cycle consistency. That's why it's only this, uh, this permuta cycle permutation is the fact that you need to always then have K, K next to each other, L, L next to each other and A, A next to each other in whatever order, but it always just needs to be going along that cycle. Well, one interesting thing about the trace, which maybe lends itself to a little bit more of a, an interpretation, 
is the fact that the trace of your eigenvalues, we haven't really gone into eigenvalues, but the trace of your eigenvalues will be the same as just the trace of the matrix to begin with. And eigenvalues have a particular very important meaning, and that is essentially saying you're summing up all of the all of the stretches and contractions along all axes. So there is some kind of conservation here between just you know looking at along individual axes to begin with and then the axis line summation of uh, eigenvalues. But like I said, that comes up when we get to eigenvalues properly in the future. So don't stress too much about that now. But for anyone who is trying to you know consistently keep the geometric interpretations in mind, that might be helpful. Uh, and so this fourth property has a, an important special case, namely that for if x and y are two n-dimensional vectors, then whether or not you go x times y transpose, giving you a square n by n matrix over there, you could then also just go y transpose times by x, get a scalar, because that's now the dot product, and take the trace of that singular, single value, that scalar, and then that is, is the same as the dot product. All right? So that's kind of similar to what I was saying last week with uh, when I showed you those concentric lines that were measuring distance when you were using the dot product of y. It was telling you how long did x move in the direction that y was defining distance. That is very similar to what the trace is trying to tell us here, at least when it's one dimensional. It's like how many of those concentric lines in total are you crossing, not just along one dimension in general. In this case, it is just one dimension. All right, and then we can work through the ideas just kind of doing the, all the algebra that we've built up up to now. So similar matrices, if A and B are similar, then you can say, well, you take the trace of B, you replace it with the definition of a similar matrix for B. You can then use that uh, cycle permutations to take this S over there. You then have S times S inverse. We know that that's an invertible matrix by definition of the similarity, and so you end up with a trace matrix. Okay. So this means that the trace as well does not depend on your basis. And this is also why um, eigen decomposition will give you your same uh, trace values, because what eigen decomposition is just at the end of the day is a change of basis. That's all it is. So that's why I've been hopping on it, but you can kind of see here that that's why that would then be conserved. All right, uh, it's three o'clock now. You guys want to take a break until quarter past three? Cool. All right, I'll see you back then.
So the, the issue I've seen with this is getting that positive and negative right at the top, isn't it? Like, I've seen people get that wrong a lot. But if you're comfortable with getting yeah, it, yeah, it's Sorry, if you're not in the I'm 
If you guys tell me, like, you know, you're concerned about things now, I can also take up the fight for you to a degree. So I am genuinely, you know, interested in your, how you're feeling about these things. So, you know, is it like, have you been given a manageable amount of work by the, the person who's given a textbook? Do you guys feel like you can manage the amount of reading you have to do for your AB and things like that? Okay. Yeah, uh, no, no issue. There's too many readings, too many articles, and uh, it's more concentrated on complex stuff, you know. So it gets, yeah. it gets tough to, adjust. yeah, it gets tough to adjust. Yeah, so like I was saying now, though, like the I think the the main skill that you need to get from this part of this exercise is to try and figure out how much detail you need to go into a research paper to get what you need out of it, right? So usually, and this is the thing that like PhD students are also really bad at, and it's like the thing that determines if you get through an honors or a master's or a PhD or whatever, is are you able to decide what you need from a paper and get that out of the paper, rather than spending your entire time just reading a paper top to bottom and trying to brute force your degree. So for next week, when is it? This week coming Friday? For your AB, I think you got an extension, right? Yeah. So for next week, Monday, um, you don't need to understand how to code up all of your methodology, right? So don't go into that much detail of it. Make sure you're getting the ideas across and trying to compare the ideas and concepts that they're speaking about. And especially when you're going and finding your own resources, make life easy for yourselves. Find the resources that are have a clear concept that you can speak about, but might not be, you know, super long or go into like a ton of detail. You can fill those out, that part of it out later on. Um, it's just about kind of 
going through it a bit more systematically and deciding what you need and doing it that way. If you're going to sit down and read all the papers you've been given and you're going to try to cram that in over the weekend, number one, that's going to suck for uh, writing your AB because you're going to have too much. And now you, what you've done is you've wasted time reading a whole bunch of papers and now you're wasting time editing an AB and you're going to waste time while you try and trim down a proposal into 10 pages. Uh, whereas if you do things at the scale they require up front, you waste time on that upfront process, but you also waste, uh, you save time on that upfront process, but you also save time on uh, how much you need to trim later on. So I would recommend at least, that, that's my advice. You guys obviously can listen, do what your supervisor say and do your own thing, but uh, that's what I told my students at least. Yeah. Open up. Leroy, does that help you, mate? Yes, yes, that was quite informative because hey, reading all of those things are, yeah. it doesn't make sense. Anymore. Cool. What it does mean is you guys need to prioritize my test next week and then write your AV over the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> So my, I do appreciate the kind of point you touched on there about the fact that like you're asked to choose uh, a topic, right? And you kind of go in and say, this sounds great. And then you sit down and you read the three to six pages you've been given and you're like, this looks like nothing I thought it would be. And <laughs> like I've made a horrible, horrible mistake. And that's a bad feeling. I don't know, if, if you are feeling that now, I would recommend you try and use push back a little bit early on. You know, like your supervisors have things in mind, they're obviously guiding you in a way that's going to get you to the project. So there's an element of trust as well with your supervisor. But if you can really see things are going in a way for this project that you're not enjoying, it will significantly improve your, your honors experience if you sort that out now. The worst part is when you're sitting in August, September, trying to brute force your way through a project you don't enjoy, that it turns out you're not interested in, and now you have like, other other stuff coming like you know September we've all been there it's uh, <laughs> tough money. <laughs> 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 
There's no turning back. That's it. You can't turn back, but you can influence how you go forward. That's uh, that's the maybe the the takeaway. You. That's also the weird thing when you when you do research, and I do. I'll stop. Kind of, I'll get off my bandwagon now. But when you do research, what you're doing is you're leading the the thing, right? It's not the same as like in a course where what you guys are doing is coming along for the ride that I'm currently taking you on with like MFPS or whatever. It's very different. What you're doing is now you and your supervisor are influencing where it's going. And, uh, you know, I can't speak to everyone, but I know that most supervisors, at least in computer science, are amenable to your own interests. So, for example, you know, like I advertise projects on computational neuroscience with the, the mouse and how it does navigation in space. Um, if any of my students came to me and said, listen, dude, this has gone a way that I really do not enjoy and I really thought this was going to be more reinforcement learning and now I'm reading about the brain and I don't care, I would change the project to try and help them. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's, I would appreciate the honesty. Rather than them getting to August, having done an A, B and a proposal on neuroscience, you know, me yawned on for six months about a topic and then they're like, ah, no. <laughs> The don't like grid cells, couldn't care less, going to give in a bad half-hearted report. That's obviously not what I want. So I think regular check-ins with your supervisor about how you're feeling and stuff like that is more important right now than anything else. All right. Well, back to MFDS and the stuff you have to do for me. Um, so here's the characteristic polynomial. And the characteristic polynomial is the first way we're going to start leading towards getting to eigen decomposition. And so it has a kind of weird definition. Again, not something I find geometrically very intuitive. I think I would say as far as like general things that I struggle to get geometric interpretation for even today, it's the ideas around the trace and this characteristic polynomial and that cycle consistency of the trace. And the, the reason is they're all kind of involved in the, oh, congratulations on, oh, I see, sorry. <laughs> I thought that was one of my students. <laughs> <laughs> congratulations to whoever that is. Um, so yeah, I find it's a little bit unintuitive still that, um, uh, that there's a, this kind of relationship between the diagonal of the matrix and what the determinants in general is saying. But what you'll see now, I think if you want to understand the characteristic polynomial, there is a way that you build it up from the geometric interpretation you have to start and then just follow through on the al algebra. And that's kind of what I've been saying along at points along this course, that if you want to understand maths and you want to get the intuition, a lot of times it's about what know, knowing what abstraction or what kind of interpretation is available to you using that and then kind of doing the manipulation afterwards, okay? And so the characteristic polynomial, I find this slide deeply impenetrable, all right? But it's because I've never thought of eigen decomposition in terms of the characteristic polynomial. But if you ask me to solve it, I would sit down and I would do this. And it's because I know that at one point I'm solving, another point I'm interpreting, and I know that there's the correspondence between the two and I can show it. And so it's kind of like moving between, you know, what spaces things are easier to do in. So as far as computation of the characteristic polynomial for a matrix A, what you're going to do is you're going to take A and subtract from it an identity matrix of size N, all right? So A is an N by N matrix. You're going to subtract lambda times by I N, and then in this case, lambda is left general. And I'll give you our, this equation here. And you get this equation just by, you know, following that Soros' rule or the butterfly method or whatever you want to call it, or following through on that, what was it, the plus method or, yeah, the plus method. Following through on the pluses method uh, for your determinant. That's how you would derive that. And those C0 through Cn uh, is called the characteristic polynomial of A. And in particular, C0 will tell you your determinant of A. And then Cn minus 1 will tell you everything else corresponding to the trace. All right. And again, it's like a positive and a negative trace effect there. So you can kind of see that there is at least something geometric going on here. The determinant obviously is a very easy thing to interpret geometrically. It's the change in volume. But you can see that what's also going on here is the trace is also adjusting. And, and in particular, that adjustment in the trace is happening because we've subtracted a diagonal matrix from A. All right? So there's a lot going on there. But what it's really doing and where this really comes from is this equation here. And this is how we get eigenvalues and eigenvectors. 
So if again, A is this M by N matrix, then what these lambdas are going to be are the eigenvalues of A, all right? And X will then be an uh, Rn matrix that is not zero, and that will give you your eigenvector of A. And in this case, the definition of an eigenvector X is some vector such that when I multiply on the left by A, it is the same as multiplying by a scalar, okay? So we call 16 the eigenvalue equation because it also gives you your lambda out, okay? And so what's kind of going on here? Well, we know that A is stretching or compressing the space, okay, along a bunch of different dimensions. If X is pointing in the correct direction already, what's going to happen is there's going to be no rotation to it. All it's going to do is get stretched or compressed like that or like that by multiplying A. But that's only in one particular direct or you know in particular dimensions directions which are defined by x all right so this would be x and that would be a by x and or another a by x down here and it's all that's going on is that when x is pointing in a direction where multiplying by a is the same as just stretching x and that as a result is what we call an eigenvector of a all right and it is a little bit of a weird intuition around it. I think when you start using it in, I think singular value decomposition is a little bit more intu intuitive as well. But I think when you start thinking in terms of like, if I have a batch of data, all right, and I have X, then if I take X times X transpose divided by one over N, that's your covariance matrix, so I'd call it Sigma. Then if I do this process on Sigma, Sigma X, what it, this is saying is that this X will tell me the directions of variance defined by, or covariance defined by my data set, all right? So it's where X is pointing along some meaningful direction in my data set that represents the most variance, all right? And then that'll then as a result be the same as just scaling up X. So that would be if you have pictures of dogs and cats, your X would point in the direction of both catness, all right, or dogness. And then if all I'm doing is trying to re reflect how much X lies along or is similar to my data matrix, then obviously then that all that's going to be doing is trying to tell me or like represent, again, dog or catness. And it comes from the fact that we have this X transposed here. So remember last week, um, again, I was telling you that when you have uh, Y transposed times by X, Y is a measure of distance for X. That's exactly what's going on here. Right, because in this case we can then sub in the sigma of one over n capital X x transposed little x. You can see here that I've got x transposed there. So every column of x is now being used as a distance measure for the curse of x. And I didn't choose my notation particularly well, so I apologize for that. But I hope the message is coming across. What's going on here is x is going, your sigma is going to be stretching and pulling in a bunch of different directions. If X aligns to a meaningful direction, then it will just be stretched. If it's already pointing in the, the correct direction that A is going to push it in, then all that's going to happen is it's going to be stretched or compressed. All right, it's not actually going to rotate or anything like that else that it could do. And that is known as principal components analysis. Um, that was a very hand wavy way of going about it, but hopefully that's giving a little bit more intuition, right? Is again, let's go through this once more. A is going to be pushing or pulling in some directions. If X is already pointing in those directions, then all A can do to it is stretch or compress, uh, and that's the same as multiplying by scanner. Okay? Everyone vaguely comfortable with this idea based on what I've said? Okay? So what I then just want to go through now is the fact that if I then take this over, and we do define this in the next slide, but I want to do it now. If we take this over, we're going to get A X minus lambda X is equal to zero. Okay. This can then be replaced by the identity of X. Okay. So identity of X. This obviously doesn't change anything about X equal to zero. And then all I'm going to do is factor out. We know that you can matrix multiplication is a linear operation. And so you can factor things out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go A minus lambda I times by X is equal to zero. 
Okay, and you can see that that is exactly what that is. All right, so that's where that, at least that part of the characteristic polynomial comes into it, is it's kind of saying, well, how do we, uh, I don't know what that is either. Anyway, um, it's saying how, like we're taking this kind of somewhat more intuitive perspective of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, all right, and then just manipulating it to get to this. And then the determinant here will, what you're ultimately going to do is look for where this determinant will lead to zero. All right. So if you want to interpret eigenvectors, I recommend using this equation 16 for some intuition and then following through the algebra and everything else. And so the following uh, important statements are equivalent. Lambda is an eigenvalue of A. It tells you how much uh, stretch applying A to X does, you know, how much applying A to X will stretch X. Uh, there exists an X element of reals that is not zero, such that this is true. We've just gone through that. Similarly, if we take this over to the other side and do this kind of whole factoring out, then the rank of A minus lambda I must be less than N, all right? And that's kind of what the whole point of this process and where we're going with this is that by doing this sort of subtraction over here, where we pull this over the, this hand side and subtract it out, what ultimately we should be doing is lowering the rank of the matrix. And that's because X is pointing in a meaningful direction for A. It's pointing in a direction that A is already varying in. So by subtracting that direction of variance from A and giving the appropriate you know, amount of scale on lambda, I can completely remove that direction of variance. And I've removed the direction of variance, I've dropped the rank. I now have a direction that is no longer going to be expanded upon. Okay, and so you can kind of see up at the top there, I've drawn that example. Um, the whole point is that A, the invertibility of A depends on whether or not A stays full rank, right? If I have a cube and I'm doing this multiplication by A, is it being compressed into a square? So in this case, A doesn't do this. But if I go A minus lambda N, then it should now be compressing into a square because I've subtracted that lambda N or yeah, lambda, lambda X. All right, I've subtracted the lambda X. So now when I apply A minus lambda X, it is going to take the box and compress it down into a square, uh, into a square. And as a result, then that's not going to be invertible, which is the same as saying the determinant doesn't exist. Because if the determinant is zero, we've lost some volume. We can no longer represent volume, or if it was 2D, we can no longer represent area or whatever. So all of these are equivalent because what they're all really just reflections of is the rank. Okay. And so you can then see that this is now where the characteristic polynomial falls out. That's why we care. If I subtract an eigenvector from a matrix, I should lose rank on that matrix. And so what I care about is solving for this lambda such that that would happen. And then that's also why the first step is to get the characteristic polynomial is because we know that if I've su successfully removed that direction of variance, I have successfully dropped rank, I should then get a zero determinant. And that's characteristic polynomial. All you do from there is just solve for where that's true. Okay, and so uh, I've gone through this already, but essentially this is the, the full way of thinking about it. The full kind of text is that you start off with this intuition of um, X is a vector that is the same as contract uh, being multiplied by A or stretching directly just by the nature of which direction it is pointing in. That's then the same as just multiplying it by the identity. That doesn't obviously change the vector. You then take it over to the left hand side, use the linearity to factor out anything that's multiplying by it. And then after that, you now just have a homogeneous system of equations, which is Tx is equal to zero. And you're trying to solve for that. Okay. And what I've been talking about at this point, when I say that X is pointing in a direction that A is already going to be stretching along, that's essentially an example of what is called collinearity and co-direction. So two vectors that point in the same direction are called co-directed. So same direction as in both going that way. 
and then two vectors are collinear if they point in the same or opposite directions. So that makes accommodation for the fact that it could also be pointing that way. Okay. So this leads to what is known as the non-uniqueness of eigenvectors, and this is a property that I kind of always forget. It's I find it fairly. It's I prefer to restrict the eigenvectors more, but anyway, we'll come to that when we do some of the value decomposition. So if x is an eigenvector of a, it is associated with a particular eigenvalue lambda. Then for any c, which is a scalar that isn't zero, it holds that you can multiply x by that value, and then the eigenvalue will stay the same. All right, and so you can see this here. So what I've done here is I've taken x times by c, so I've already stretched x. Then I multiply by a. Okay, I can factor out the c. But we now know that by definition of the eigenvectors of A, you can replace it by lambda x. And then now you just have the product of two scalars. So you can uh, swap them around again. And so you can run through that whole process. And what this essentially now tells us is that A times by that Cx, that stretched vector, is the same as just doing lambda times by that stretched vector. And so lambda is still an eigenvalue of A. But admittedly, that's kind of intuitive. Because lambda was a property of A, it wasn't really a property of X. All X was doing was checking what the stretch is along that direction. It doesn't matter how long that vector is to begin with, A is still going to act on it in the same way. And so that's what the eigenvector is more, that's more important uh, why the eigenvalue is telling us what A does to any vector in that direction. And then the eigenvector is just the direction that, it, that, that effect is happening along. So, all vectors are collinear to X. Are also, all vectors that are collinear to X are also the eigenvectors of A. So you could find any C times X would be a valid eigenvector uh, for A in that case. Okay, and then we can say theorem 4.8. So if lambda's element of reals is an eigenvalue of A, if and only if lambda is a root of the characteristic polynomial of A. And what that is saying by that whole root thing is like, when does that determinant equal zero? When did I take a direction with x and get and find lambda such that x was stretched appropriately to imitate the stretch that a would apply to x, right? So this definition there, this definition there, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the corresponding stretch in the direction of x that a is doing. By definition, x is already pointing in the right direction. Okay, and then that leads to a bit of terminology that is unintuitive, and I do want you guys to know it though, is algebraic multiplicity. So if A is a square matrix and it has the eigenvalue lambda i, the, I, the algebraic multiplicity of lambda i, okay, so it's a property of A, it's a property of this eigenvalue of A. The algebraic multiplicity of this particular eigenvalue is the number of times that eigenvalue appears as an answer to the characteristic polynomial. Okay. Geometrically, how many directions exist that have the same degree of stretch by A? That's the, that's the algebraic multiplicity, but it's the kind of thing that you can just rely on as being a mathematical concept just by definition. What you're going to do is you're going to do the eigenvalue uh, or the eigen decomposition. You're going to look at how many times that value pops up. If it's lambda is equal to two, you look how many twos are there. That's the algebraic multiplicity. If you end up with something like two to the power of three, there's three. That shows up three times. That's then the algebraic multiplicity is three. That'll come up more when we do an example of uh, I vectors uh, next lecture. Okay. So that's the algebraic multiplicity. How many times an eigenvalue is repeated? Then we can define eigenspaces and eigenspectrum. These are more just definitions. If you understand. My favorite version of this, again, which is that that one. If you understand that, everything else is just manipulation. Um, so the eigenspace for A, which is a square matrix, is the set of all eigenvectors of A associated with a particular eigenvalue, uh, and that spans a subspace of Rn. So which, what subspace of that A is kind of acting on has the same stretch. So the algebraic multiplicity tells us how many times an eigenvalue is repeated. And then if we take all of those repeated eigenvalues, we look at the eigenvectors and we look at the vector space they define, that will be the eigenspace for that eigenvalue. Okay? It's all the dimensions that have the same amount of stretch being uh, occurring because of the multiplication by A. 
It is denoted by this E lambda term here. And so that's the eigenspace of lambda. So eigenspace of lambda 2, for example. Um, the set of all eigenvalues of A is then called the eigenspectrum or just the spectrum. So if you look at all eigenvectors that you've, um, uh, sorry, all eigenvalues that A has, and that's just forms a, a set of values, and that's called the spectrum of A. All right, and you can see this here. So ES, which is the kind of eigenspace of your spectrum, is then just the union of all the sub the sub eigenspaces, right? Because by definition, all the other eigenvectors will come to this, they're all going to be orthogonal. Um, you can then just take the union of them. So that kind of comes up a little bit earlier here. So the spectrum of A tells us a lot about whether an iterative method will converge. Uh, so again, it's usually like the ideas around if you're doing a power of a matrix, if you're saying A to the power of N, what you're doing is essentially applying A N times to a system. Um, the way you would do that is to do the eigen decomposition of A, firstly, and then what you do is you raise the eigenvalues to the power of N. I have applied that stretch N times. They're always going to just be along the same direction. Um, so I've applied that stretch as many times as I want in the appropriate directions. But now you have the eigenvalues, which are all just scalars, so you can raise them to the power. The problem with this is that if you have an eigenvalue that is greater than one, and you're applying A repeatedly an infinite number of times, as you would in like maybe some dynamical system, then uh, like, yeah, that's kind of what I'm showing at the bottom here, um, where you, you're kind of updating X based on some matrix A, then if you want to run that into infinity and you have a eigenvalue that is greater than one in A, what you're always going to be doing is stretching along that direction. And so you're never going to stabilize. So a lot of times what we're looking at when we're doing these dynamical systems and things like that, is, and like they're called attractor dynamics, is to see what uh, stable point or steady state A will take us to. Um, a cool thing is you can model uh, working memory in human brains with something like this. But uh, we won't go into that. But that works just like a uh, stable, like a steady state dynamic system. Um, and so for a given eigenvalue lambda of A, it is worth noting that the eigenspace for that lambda is the solution space of the homogeneous system of linear equations here, but once you sub in that lambda, right? Okay. So geometrically, the eigenvector corresponds to a non-zero eigenvalue corresponding to a non-zero eigenvalue points in a direction that is stretched by the linear mapping. We've gone through that. The eigenvalue is the factor by which it is stretched. And if the eigenvalue is negative, the direction of stretch is flipped. And this is also why when we we're saying earlier that having a negative determinant flips along the axis, that's because we were stretching in the opposite direction. This eigenvalue will now tell you which exact direction that was that was being flipped. Okay, so that's kind of the relationship between your determinants and your spectrum here. In fact, if you take the product of all your eigenvalues, you get the determinant because your eigenvalues tell you how much you're stretching along a direction, and your determinant tells you how much you. Uh, Melo, Devin. Uh, Leroy, are you back? Cool. Um, okay, so that's, I, I'm kind of, I know I'm maybe hammering home a lot, a lot of this, but this is like I was saying, where a lot of these ideas start being tied together about rank and determinants and space and whether or not it's invertible, it's all being tied in together by whether or not A is preserving information. And what we're trying to do now is figure out what way do I manipulate A such that it loses information. That's important because then when I solve this equation, 
that means that I know which di direction was originally informative. So if a of x is valid, but a minus lambda i of x gives us zero, then I know that whatever lambda i had put in there corresponded to some kind of stretch that a was doing. It's told me something about a by the fact that when I did that, I lost rank. And that's the game we're playing. We're trying to figure out the a values that will result in me losing rank. Then what we do is now that we, and that's again, what will tell me that is this matrix here. Whenever it loses rank, it means I've picked a correct lambda. And how do I know whether or not it's lost rank? Does my determinant equal zero? Okay. If my determinant equals zero, I've taken my box and I've reduced volume to nothing. I've lost the dimension. So that's how you then start by calculating that. You've now found a lambda that mattered, that was meaningful corresponding to A. Then what you do is you take this and you try and now find your X's by plugging in all your lambdas that were meaningful. And now that X will tell you which direction corresponded to that lambda. Cool. How many of those lambdas have the same value is then algebraic multiplicity. And then if you have a negative lambda or a negative determinant, you've already done is you've flipped your axis. And so you can look at the case of the identity matrix. And so a simple but interesting case worth considering is the n by n identity matrix. So if you put that in here, then as we point out, the determinant of the identity will just be one. But now you have one minus lambda along every diagonal. So all it is is one minus lambda raised to the power of, excuse me, raised to the power of n. So in order to find the eigenvalues, we then set the characteristic polynomial to zero. So you know what lambda value would lose rank. And that's kind of obvious. It's just lambda is equal to one. Obviously, then that will then be zero, right? So you've now taken what was your one axis of your 1D cube, and you just smushed it literally that way, and then stopped. And now you have a square of one by one. That also give you a zero determinant because you've now gone from volume to area, bless you, and that's zero volume. Okay, so that's kind of a very literal intuitive interpretation of what's going on there. And then does anyone want to tell me what the algebraic multiplicity then is of lambda equal to one? So there's a definition of algebraic multiplicity if that helps. Yeah. N. Yes. Correct. All right. It's because n was the power there. So moreover, if you then take lambda times by uh, or this identity times by x and sub in the lambda, you're going to get one by x. So then all that tells us is that uh, x kind of in its own right was the the eigen vector, and it just means that it's axis aligned. All right. So every column of i is going to be an eigen uh, vector. So just every, you know, no, uh, X, Y, Z of my box was the eigenvector. So that means that the E1, so the eigenspace for uh, lambda one for that eigenvalue of the identity matrix spans all N dimensions. All right, and all N standard basis vectors of Rn are eigenvectors of I. So in that case, it was literally just, you know, like in 2D, let's say it would be, you know, one, zero, zero, one times by X, is the same as just getting to x, obviously, but then you've now read off for both of those columns. That would then be, uh, that's how you get to the eigenvectors. Should be kind of straightforward, I guess. All right, so that's a, a useful example. At least try and build up some intuition. Um, and so commonly used properties of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, a matrix A and its transpose uh, will have the same eigenvalues, but not necessarily the same eigenvectors. But this kind of comes from what I was saying earlier of your determinant having whether or not I use A or A transpose, your determinants will be the same. So as you know, your determinant is equal to the product of your eigenvalues. And so they then need to be the same. All right. And then the eigenspace for lambda is in the null space of uh, that equation there. But we've kind of covered that because that's obviously exactly what you guys know that that's exactly what this was doing to begin with up here. Okay, but by thinking about it in terms of null space, 
what it means is I started with a direction of A, that uh, a direction of my space that A would stretch. I've removed that direction with the correct amount of opposite stretch. So now I want to know which direction does this entire matrix no longer operate on that A originally did. Okay. And so that would then tell me in which direction I've lost rank, in which direction have I squished the box. And so that will then just be your null space, right? You know that then the, the part of your space that a matrix can't act on or that maps to zero will give you your kernel. Okay. So you've tied in that idea as well. Your, it's now you've taken something that was in the image of A, so a part of the space that A did act on, and you've now made it into the kernel of this matrix here. Turns out that's your eigen, eigenspace. And if you do it to like a square covariance matrix, well, obviously this covariance matrix is square, it's x times x transpose. But if you then do it to covariance matrix, what it will tell you is which directions of your data space have the most variance. Okay? And you can look, determine that by how large the singular value is or the eigenvalue is. If your eigenvalue is larger, it means your covariance matrix is more stretched in that direction. All right. And so that'll tell you your distinction between tats and dots, let's say. Is, I think this is lost. No, this is the last slide. But is everyone, uh, is this kind of starting to make geometric sense for everyone? You know, why we care about the determinant of A minus lambda I and those kind of things, how it corresponds into ideas of rank and null space. Are these things starting to all kind of maybe come together and become a little bit more intuitive? I'm happy to keep running through this as many times as you need. What's up? Could you explain to me why do we care how the, the matrix is traced or why do we care of that? Why do we care? So, I mean, in general, we won't, right? Like, I mean, not won't, but it's, it's somewhat arbitrary until you have a problem, okay? So that's, and that's the thing. It depends on what problem you're working on. And so it's almost like a math joke. You hear everyone put the word eigen in front of everything. You've heard of like eigen faces or, you know, whatever. All that means is like, what is the parts of that data that had the most stretch? But that would then depend on what the data is, right? So like I was saying, if you have pictures of cats and dogs and you've got the covariance matrix of those pixels, pixels what that is telling you is how varying pixel one, one impacts pixel one, two, and so on, right? So you know in that case that if I have like a, a pixel, a picture of a cat, there's my, my cat. And I know that if I have that green dot there is the color gin, is like a ginger color, then I know that the color, the thing next to it over there is also probably going to be ginger. And I know that this pixel is also going to be ginger and so on, because it's, if I know I'm looking at cats, there is some kind of structure towards how a cat looks, okay? And so when I get the covariance matrix of a whole bunch of these cat pictures, what I'm gonna get is in general, how when I change this pixel, does this pixel change, does this pixel change, does this pixel change? And so each of those is telling you how when I stretch along this dimension of the top and right of its ear, how does the other pixel so-called stretch and so on? You know, what color does it have? Um, when I then do the covariance of a bunch of those, those pictures, that tells me this on average, how much each of those pixels relates to each other. If I do the eigen decomposition on that, so A here would then be your covariance matrix of like sigma, okay? What I've then done is I've taken this N by N representation of how my pixels vary. And I've found the direction of that space that corresponds to a lot of stretch. And a lot of stretch in this case just means that those pixels are accurate, okay? Because zero is black on images and color is anything that is off of zero, right? So ginger is gonna be something like in RGB, it's you know, 0 0.8, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 or something. So it's like a very red color, okay? This. 0 0.8, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 is pointing in a direction of 3D space, okay? And so that's what I'm looking for in this particular concept is based on a whole bunch of these images, what is that direction of my data that is consistently away from zero? And consistently away from zero in this case would look like stretch, okay? 
And so then I just go through this process of, well, what happens if I remove that stretch? So I've now, if in this case, X would correspond to the direction of ginger. I've removed the concept of ginger from my data set. I now no longer have, in my data set, I would now no longer have ginger cats. So for every ginger in my data set, I've gone ginger cat minus the color ginger. I have nothing. You know what I mean? Like I've, I've lost that representation in those images. And so you've now lost rank. You've lost the ability to represent that color. And that's the whole point then. It's then when you take your determinants, the determinant's going to tell you, well, you've lost rank. You've, you've lost an important point of variation in representing cats. And then that's all we're looking for. Lambda will then tell you how much that stretch is. So what is actually the, the kind of color, you know, how, how much that is present in your data. So if you have like heaps and heaps of pictures of cats that are ginger, then that's going to be a huge kind of uh, stretch. Whereas if it's kind of shows up once or twice, that's going to be less of a, of a prevalent statistical stretch. Um, and so, yeah, then, then your lambda tells you how much it's there. And then your eigenvector will tell you which direction, what is the concept that is coming out in that data. Does that help you? Cool. All right. Guys online, are we still following? Are we happy? Yes, yes, we're happy. Cool. So last slide, and then we'll go through some tutorials for a couple of minutes. So commonly used properties of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Similar matrices possess the same eigenvalues. Therefore, a linear mapping has eigenvalues that are independent of the choice of basis of its transformation matrix. So we now have three key characteristic parameters of matrix that are independent of the choice of basis. Your eigenvalues, your determinants, and your trace. Not to be funny, we have one, eigenvalues. Determinants and trace depend on your eigenvalues, okay? And so symmetric positive definite matrices always have positive real eigenvalues. And the good news for us is that the covariance matrix, essentially what I was just talking about now, is a symmetric positive definite matrix. Okay, symmetric because you go X times X transpose, and then positive definite because your data is usually just only positive values for like images and stuff like that. Um, we'll look more into that next week. But uh, yeah, when we say symmetric positive definite matrices, Think of a covariance matrix. That is the easiest example. And in data science, that's pretty much always going to be what you care about. Okay. Uh, but yeah, you can see the property. Again, I've written out what a similar matrix is at the top there. So A is equal to S inverse BS. Uh, these could be eigenvectors. Okay. And then this would then tell you your eigenvalues A. It doesn't then matter how you represent the space. There will always be a fundamental quantity that will give you the same answer. All right, everyone happy? Do we have any kind of questions? Are we getting, again, the, the ideas around what data looks like in vector spaces and what it means? Cool. All right, uh, let's go for, yeah, a 15 minute break. Let me set up quickly for the um, group consultation for whoever wants to stay, whoever wants to leave, that's fine too. Uh, it will not be recorded, I'm afraid, for people online. Um, but feel free to use Discord as much as humanly possible. Uh, I will do my best over the next week to be very readily available to you guys on Discord, uh, kind of even like later into the evenings and stuff like that if you need. Um, so yeah, make full use of that. But yeah, anyway, before I stop the recording and shut down the teams, guys, are you, I suppose I can keep the teams going. I just don't enjoy recording it usually. I'll keep the teams going. I'm just going to stop the recording. But before I stop the recording, yes, yes, anybody yes, want to yes, bring something up? Oh, yes, I was asking if you can please keep the teams on, even if it's not recorded. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll just stop the recording. Cool. Okay, thanks, everyone, for whoever watching this on YouTube later. Bye-bye.